I was not aware of how overwhelming that attention would become, nor the extent to which it would affect both my public duties and my personal life in a manner that's been hard to bear. My first priority will continue to be our children, William and Harry, who deserve as much love and care and attention as I am able to give, as well as a, an appreciation of the tradition into which they were born. I stared for a while in disbelief. And I took her hand and said, wake up. And nothing happened. Has not Khan have been the princess's companion for over two years? I find a very normal person. Yes. We all have our drawbacks and, and um, qualities. But I, I found her as, you know, as someone who just uh, met her, I found a very normal person. A uh, normal person with great qualities and of course there's some, you know, um, personal drawbacks like we have, like habits, for example. And I think she did a great uh, work for the country and for people all over the world. Nobody knew about Hasna Khan that was not played out on the world stage. Whereas after they'd broken up, the princess was invited to the south of France by the Mohammed al Fayeds. She met Dodi al Fayed. Did you know that the romance of the princess and Dodi al Fayed was 30 days from beginning to end? I said to the princess, when are you coming home? I'm coming home on Sunday, Paul. I'm on this boat. It's freezing cold downstairs. It's boiling hot on deck. I'm sending these pictures out and nobody's coming back to me. I'm having no communication. I need to come home. But the only way home is on the Harrods jet. The only way I can get home is via Paris because Dodie has to go to Paris to do some business for his father. How is he with you? Oh, he's very spoiling. He's very generous, the princess said. He's given me a necklace, some earrings. He's given me a watch. I said, you know what's coming next, don't you? He's gonna give you a ring. Do you think so? Oh, yes. He'll give you a ring. But remember, when he gives it to you, put it on the fourth finger of your right hand. Yes, that's the thing to do. I'll do that. You always know what to do. That's exactly what I'll do. I spoke to the princess the day before and made all her plans for her return. Then she rang me from the hotel in Paris and said, oh, I'm going to be a little late, so will you arrange everything a day later? I said, yeah, sure, it's no problem. 10 months before that, the princess had written me a letter. And in that letter, she said, in her own handwriting, on her own stationery, her words were, the next few months are the most difficult in my life. I fear that my husband is planning an accident in my car, dash, head injuries, 
in order that he can remarry. Now, when you read those words, a prophecy the princess made 10 months before she died, it's rather eerie. I hope you can find it in your hearts to understand and to give me the time and space that has been lacking in recent years. We interrupt this film to tell you we are getting reports that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been badly injured in a car crash in France. French radio is saying that the accident happened in western Paris when the car she was traveling in collided with another vehicle in a tunnel. The princess is reported to have been taken to hospital. There is no news of her condition, and as yet the report is unconfirmed. It's also reported that a passenger in the princess's car was killed. One report, quoting French police, says it is her friend, Dodi al -Fayed. First, we'd heard the princess had had head injuries and broken her arm. And then at two o'clock in the morning, we heard that the injuries were more serious than they first thought. And it wasn't until about three o'clock that they told us that the accident had been fatal. And during this time, my thoughts were, I must get to Paris, because if she's incapacitated in any way, she'll need me to support her, to take care of her, to keep her safe. And when I heard that the accident was fatal, I thought there's even more reason for me to be there. I do need to keep her safe. I need to protect her. I need to look after her. So early Sunday morning, I arrived in Paris and was taken straight by the British ambassador, taken to the hospital. And I approached the bed, it was a hospital bed, and the princess was covered in a white sheet. Her head and her feet were visible, and her hands were on top of the sheet. And I approached the bed and I stared for a while in disbelief, and I watched the fan whirring on the side of the bed table. A fan was moving on the bedside table, and as it moved, it moved the princess's hair, and I could see her eyelashes moving. And I took her hand and said, wake up. You're asleep, aren't you? Wake up. And nothing happened. She was soft and warm. Not dead at all. It was quite a while before I realized that she was actually not with us and remembered what she told me about death. She said, at that moment when you pass, your spirit lifts from the body and you hang around for a while and watch. So I said, you're here, aren't you? You're here. You're watching me. You're watching what I'm doing. And I'll try and do it the way you'd want me to do it. So I stayed with her.
It must have been very difficult for the Prince of Wales to come to Paris because he was estranged from his wife, divorced from his wife, didn't particularly like her. He was there, of course, for the boys as their father. But he was out of sorts, didn't know how to behave. This was new territory. His ex-wife was dead. I feel like everyone else in this country today, utterly devastated. Our thoughts and prayers are with Princess Diana's family, in particular her two sons, the two boys. Our hearts go out to them. We are today a nation in Britain in a state of shock, in mourning, in grief that is so deeply painful for us. She was a wonderful and a warm human being, though her own life was often sadly touched by tragedy. She touched the lives of so many others in Britain throughout the world with joy and with comfort. How many times shall we remember her in how many different ways? With the sick, the dying, with children, with the needy. When with just a look or a gesture that spoke so much more than words, she would reveal to all of us the depth of her compassion and her humanity. You know how, how difficult things were for her from time to time. I'm sure we can only guess at, but the people everywhere, not just here in Britain, everywhere, they kept faith with Princess Diana. They liked her, they loved her. They regarded her as one of the people. She was the people's princess. And that's how she will stay, how she will remain in our hearts and in our memories forever. And we brought her home and I came home and I had a little walk in the gardens of Kensington Palace and saw people beginning to bring their floral tributes. Maybe just 20 or 30 of them, maybe a hundred. Nothing like what would happen that week.
At the time of Diana's death, of course, there was great animosity towards the royal family. They felt the queen wasn't doing enough. She was keeping her grandchildren safe at Balmoral, but she wasn't appearing for her people in London. The people thought she'd lost touch with the nation. I remember watching that broadcast, unprecedented broadcast of the Queen from Buckingham Palace live, the only live broadcast she's ever made. And she spoke from the heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. I admired and respected her for her energy and commitment to others, and especially for her devotion to her two boys. This week at Balmoral, we have all been trying to help William and Harry come to terms with the devastating loss that they and the rest of us have suffered. No one who knew Diana will ever forget her, Millions of others who never met her, but felt they knew her, will remember her. I, for one, believe there are lessons to be drawn from her life and from the extraordinary and moving reaction to her death. I share in your determination to cherish her memory. And I remember pulling up a chair and leaning on her coffin covered in the raw standard and talking to her all night long. And then morning came and I could hear the crunch of the wheels of the gun carriage on the gravel outside and I knew they'd come to take her away. I didn't want to let go. And I watched them load the coffin onto the gun carriage and I stood in the doorway. And as they gave the order to pull away, I remember bowing. I remember bowing for the last time. And saying, goodbye, your wireless. Because um, that's it. in my eyes, she was always your Royal Highness.
I stand before you today, the representative of a family in grief, in a country in mourning, before a world in shock. We are all united, not only in our desire to pay our respects to Diana, but rather in our need to do so. Today is our chance to say thank you for the way you brightened our lives, even though God granted you but half a life. We will all feel cheated, always, that you were taken from us so young. And yet we must learn to be grateful that you came along at all. Only now you are gone do we truly appreciate what we are now without. And we want you to know that life without you is very, very difficult. For all the status, the glamour, the applause, Diana remained throughout a very insecure person at heart, almost childlike in her desire to do good for others so she could release herself from deep feelings of unworthiness, of which her eating disorders were merely a symptom. She would want us today to pledge ourselves to protecting her beloved boys, William and Harry, from a similar fate. And I do this here, Diana, on your behalf. We will not allow them to suffer the anguish that used regularly to drive you to tearful despair. And beyond that, on behalf of your mother and sisters, I pledge that we, your blood family, will do all we can to continue the imaginative and loving way in which you are steering these two exceptional young men, so that their souls are not simply immersed by duty and tradition, but can sing openly as you planned. Above all, we give thanks for the life of a woman. I'm so proud to be able to call my sister. The unique, the complex, the extraordinary and irreplaceable Diana, whose beauty, both internal and external, will never be extinguished from our minds. Shut up. Charles. Thank you so much. Then on the Royal Train, with the Royal Family, with Charles and Harry and William, to Northampton. And we arrived and had lunch with Earl Spencer in the dining room. Someone came in and whispered into Charles Spencer's ear. He got up. Diana's arrived, everybody. So we all got up into the hallway and the Princess's coffin had just arrived at the front door. And they lifted her high and took her on its procession towards the island. They built a small pontoon across to the lake. So we all followed across the bridge to a small clearing where a hole had been dug. The soldiers lowered the coffin. So Prince Charles and William and Harry and the family left the island and left me standing there. And I was the last one with the sunlight coming through the trees. I looked down into the hole and there's a metal plate. 
It didn't say Her Royal Highness, the Princess of Wales. It said Diana, Princess of Wales. I thought, why couldn't they, in the last moment, have given her back her title? It wouldn't have hurt anyone. So I picked up some earth and threw it into the hole. And that's, that's where my life was. And I can remember begging her, saying, why didn't you take me with you? No. <laughs> What did you see? What did you see? She cared, she cared massively. We've been left in no doubt at all that we were the most important thing in her life. And then after that, it was everyone else. Really caring, so sweet, and very much missed by not only us, but I think a lot of people. And here we are, 20 years later. We're still talking about her because Diana has become an icon. We're talking about her because she changed the rule book. She tore out pages from that dusty old book and she rewrote those rules. She changed the royal family forever. The ghost of Diana will always haunt the House of Windsor. She changed the rules for the women she'd never meet. She changed the rules for Catherine so that she would have a better life, a better passage. And whoever Harry marries, she changed the rules for her too. So in a way, she's changing the rules for her children. Her children, William and Harry, are her legacy to the world. They will finish their mother's work. Um, basically, um, I wanted to do something constructive um, for my gap here, rather than, um, I mean, uh, I could do quite a lot of work, but I thought this was a, a bit more of a way of um, making, uh, trying to help people out and uh, meet a whole range of other different people from um, different countries, and at the same time uh, helping people um, in remote areas of Chile. <laughs> What? I don't know if I can follow in her footsteps, but I mean, William and I will always try and, you know, achieve what she, well, try and achieve what she achieved in the, in the short space of time that she did. But I think it's, you know, like, like mother, like son, like father, like son. Um, and if you've got, if you, if she always, if she and our father, but you know, her especially, I suppose. Hi! And I think you're both um, very closely involved in the organisation of these events, both the church service and, and the concert. Can you tell us a bit about that? Um, <clears throat> well, we both wanted to, to put our, um, our sort of stamp on it. We wanted to represent exactly what our mother would have wanted, um, how she was and, and all that sort of things. So therefore, the church service alone isn't enough. We wanted to have this big concert with, you know, full of energy, full of... Um, 
sort of fun and happiness, which I knew she would have wanted. And on her birthday as well, it's got to be the best birthday present she's ever had. And with it, we can, by the two of us um, organising it, um, we wanted to have the, uh, the fact that the evening is all about our, our mother. Uh, the main purpose is to celebrate and, and to have fun and to remember her in, in a fun way. It's, uh, the idea is we wanted to get um, uh, artists that our mother really uh, loved um, and then um, artists that both Harry and I enjoy. And then in the middle with the, with the ballet and, and Angela Weber, um, obviously she loved her dancing and her musicals. So with that, um, you've got a sort of a, something different. It's not just any old concert. Um, it, it's going to be different and it's, it's going to be interesting. If it works, it'll be brilliant. If it doesn't, then... Um, but we won't be, we won't be in the country. You, you won't see us for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. And uh, will we see you dancing? Uh, I really hope not. Um, I hope so. Not him, not me. I hope we can get a chance to see him dance. It'll be a terrifying sight if we do. 36 years old, you don't expect your mother to die. Her untimely death catapulted those boys into the forefront of the royal family. They are the royal family's future. One day, we will see King William and Queen Catherine on the throne of England. And strangely enough, when William and Harry came to see me at Kensington Palace shortly after their mother died, I said to them, you must take something. Take something which belonged to her that you can keep safe. What do you want, William, I said. I'd like Mummy's Cartier watch, the one that Grandpa Spencer gave to her for her 21st birthday. Okay, I went to the safe and I got the watch. And what about you, Harry? What would you like? I remember, he said, when I held mummy's hand when I was a small boy, that ring always hurt me because it's so big. Do you mean her engagement ring? Yes. So I went to the safe and gave Harry Diana's engagement ring. William told Harry that he was going to become engaged to Catherine. Harry said to him, wouldn't it be fitting if she had mummy's ring? And then one day that ring will be sat on the throne of England. So Harry gave up his precious treasure. His one thing he kept from his mother, he gave to his brother. That selfless, kind, and exactly who Diana was. Harry has Diana's personality. William has his father's. Harry is fun, naughty, great time out. William is serious and studious and kingly. Two boys from the same parents, two boys of very different nature. Nineteen eighty one was a long time ago, and that romantic wedding was right for the time. Fast forward a few years and watch Kate and William getting married in Westminster Abbey. It was a different affair. It was more personal. Kate's a very lucky woman because she has something which Diana never had. She has the love and support of a man who truly adores her. And with that strength behind her, she can go the distance. She can go all the way. She doesn't need anything else. There was one thing missing, of course, the princess. And had she been there, she'd have been so proud of her big boy. She called him her big boy. <laughs> and she would have loved grandchildren.
I am going to become a Olympic champion for the second time, hopefully. So, um, yeah, it's um, very exciting news. I can't wait to see my brother suffer more. Um, and with any luck, if it's a girl, then he'll suffer even, even greater, I think. I'd love to see him try and cope with that. Diana would have loved being here now. She was robbed of the opportunity of loving her grandchildren, and especially Charlotte, because Diana always wanted a girl. And to have another baby girl in the family would have been just, would have made everything for Diana. She would have loved Kate too. William and Kate never put a foot wrong. They're the future of the royal family. Diana never had the Spencer family to give her support. Kate has the Middletons, who are devoted to her. Kate's family will give George and Charlotte the grounding which William and Harry never had with the Spencers. Can you just see the Middleton influence on the Cambridge family? It's shaping them. It's making those boys more normal more natural, and watch over the years, as, as Charlotte and George grow, they will come out into the public, they will touch people, and they will pull the heartstrings of people all around the world. And that's why the royal family will survive, because they will be in touch with ordinary people. I watched Diana blossom from a shy young girl, 18 years old at Balmoral Castle. I watched the years pass by. She was pushed in the deep end and told to swim. She was told to survive. She was never taught to survive. She learned very quickly and she did. And through the romantic years and then through the power dressing years and then the simple dressing years. becoming an icon, becoming the most famous woman in the world. But you know, she had those two boys for long enough to instill in them her hopes, her dreams, and her ideals. They are able to go out into the crowd and touch people because of Diana. They're able to come down to people because of Diana. The royal family had never done that before. You see Diana with children on her knees. You see Harry with children on his knees. He's following his mother's example. Diana set the trend for this new royal family. The two boys now follow her example. And one day, when William is king, the first thing he'll do is restore his mother's titles and raise her into the position which she should have been raised 20 years ago. Diana wanted William and Harry to have as normal life as possible. That's why she took them to Highgrove every weekend. That's why she took them to Alton Towers. That's why she took them to the zoo. She wanted to introduce them to normal life, knowing that life behind palace walls can sometimes be toxic. He could have twisted their minds. She wanted to set them on the right path from the very beginning. She never once allowed her unfaltering love for us to go unspoken or undemonstrated. She will always be remembered for her amazing public work. But behind the media glare, to us, just two loving children. She was quite simply the best mother in the world. How well are you coping with all the press attention? Well, as you can, you can see, you can tell. <laughs> are, you, are you bearing up with it quite well, though? Because it must be quite a strain with all of us after you. Well, it is, naturally. And you, you're coping with it all right, though. You seem to be doing very well. Well, I'm still around. <laughs> I have it on very good authority that the quest for perfection 
our society demands, can leave the individual gasping for breath at every turn. I saw it merely as a distraction because I'm not a political figure. I, I, I am a humanitarian figure and always have been and always will be. I hope you can find it in your hearts to understand and to give me the time and space that has been lacking in recent years. My favourite memory of the princess is a very personal one because I was the only witness to it. And it was a regular occurrence and it used to thrill me. I used to hear the piano being played in the drawing room. And the princess was an accomplished pianist. Her favourite piece of music was Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto Number no. 2 which, if you were a film historian, you would know was played throughout David Lean's film, Brief Encounter, one of our favorite films. We'd sit and watch that black and white movie with a box of tissues between us. What do you believe? That it's the same with you, that you've fallen in love too. I would sneak up the staircase and peep in through the drawing room door and watch that vision with wet hair scraped back over her head in a white toweling robe, tied tight, head back, playing Rachmaninoff's piano concerto. That was magic. When that happened, when we lost Diana, the world stopped just for one brief second. Everybody took a deep breath in disbelief. What was that? If you could distill that essence, that was Diana. But it was something more than that. I think it's what people call magic. Mm -hmm.